How Libya Builds Brand New Rivers Across the Sahara The government of the United States, United Kingdom, European Union, Canada and Australia all continue to issue a maximum level for travel advisory warning and urging against all travel for their citizens to this country due to the ongoing state of violence and danger. Even two years after the most recent civil war came to an end with a ceasefire agreement, tens of thousands of people have died as a result of the civil conflict and bloodshed that have ravaged the North African nation of Libya for the majority of the last 10 years. Moving on, we won't be focusing on that. Instead, we want to share with you one of the most amazing aspects about Libya and how they were able to complete one of the most amazing macro-engineering projects in human history. Even the West could not imagine seeing this. Before we continue, don't forget to subscribe, turn on the notification bell and concentrate to every detail of this project to avoid missing out. Libya is a very dry country, but you have to realize just how scarce the water supply is here. More than 90% of Libya's land area is a harsh desert. In Libya, there are places where it doesn't rain for up to 10 years at a time. Libya is one of the least populated, driest and less suitable locations on earth for running and maintaining a civilization due to its lack of sustainable water resources. There isn't a single river of any type in Libya making it both the only country in Africa and one of the very few in the world without access to fresh water. Libya is located in the incredibly limited area of territory above this alignment where people could really establish towns and sustain civilization. Only two areas in the country have sufficient water resources for farming and agriculture. Up north around Tripoli, the nation's capital and largest city, and down northeast around Benghazi, the second largest city. 90% of the population in Libya at this time were all situated in the four major cities of the country, where it rains once in a while. Libya is similar in shape and size comparably to Moldova in Europe. It will be surprising for you to learn that Libya's entire population is only around 7 million people. Most of Libya is simply an uninhabitable wasteland from a civilizational perspective because Libya has very few habitable areas up in the north and it's much more helpful to picture Libya's true shape and size as being more like this. The vast majority of Libya's territory is simply unusable for civilization. In the 50s, Libya's population was only a little over a million and was probably not all that different from what it has been thousands of years earlier, during the Roman era. The country was in a terrible state of poverty and had only recently declared its independence from Italy. The sudden discovery of oil in 1956 would forever alter its reliance on foreign aid and the meager rent it received from American and British air bases that were situated on its territory. With the discovery of oil in the nation of Libya, one of the largest oil reserves ever was discovered on Earth. It was concluded that Libya's oil reserves were the largest on the African continent and the 10th largest of any country in the world, and to top it off, they were strategically located close to Europe, one of the largest oil consumers in the world. The ensuing oil boom brought Libya income, employment opportunities, and wealth on a scale that has never been witnessed before. And within 20 years of the country's first oil discovery in 1956, population growth began. Libya's population had roughly doubled by 1976, and it increased more than twice that amount by 1996. However, with this enormous and unheard of chance for population growth, Libya began to experience its enduring problem once more, which is the lack of water. There was simply not enough water to support a lot of people, even within the small area along the Mediterranean coast where it actually rained. Knowing they would need to find more water to keep up with the population growth, the Libyans began looking for alternative sources of water in a nearly desperate manner. They mainly offered three different responses, each of which was terrible in its own particular way. 
The first was of course that they could theoretically construct a system of purification plants that would transform impure salt water into drinkable fresh water. And they could have ideally constructed a system of purifying a significant portion of the Mediterranean very successfully in nearby Libya. In around 10,000 years from now, the cycle of heavy rainfall across the Sahara, which was the case many thousand years ago, is anticipated to continue and transform the Sahara once more into a lush green grassland with abundant rainfall, as it was 250,000 years ago. However, during the tens of thousands of years of rain that fell in northern Africa prior to the end of the rain cycle, the rain collected in reservoirs that were just below the surface in the 1950s in Libya. This was not known by anyone, but was later discovered by scientists that these reservoirs were actually a source of fresh water. The reservoirs in Libya alone are thought to hold about 35,000 cubic kilometers of water, which is a significant amount. After quickly winning the oil jackpot, the Libyans had just struck the water jackpot, but there were a few pretty big problems with the newfound water source. First of all, there is no way to replenish any of the water once it has been removed from the underground reservoirs. The amount of water discovered in these reservoirs just below the surface in Libya can be estimated to Africa's second and third largest lakes, as this amount of water had previously fallen as rain tens to hundreds of thousands of years ago, back when northern Africa was more humid and temperate. Now, under the current cycle of no water, this region will receive almost no rainfall for thousands of years. At first, the Libyans thought they could simply use the water where it already existed to build massive agricultural projects in the middle of the desert, but this initial strategy failed. Hundreds of miles from any of Libya's actual population centers in the north along the coast, these projects were dispersed across a number of locations in the country's center and south. Gaddafi, the president of Libya at the time, was destined to become one of the most bizarre, disruptive, and enduring dictators of the 20th century. The plan was to simply ignore geography by building their own man-made river, running pipes between the vast recently discovered reservoirs in the south and rapidly growing towns along the Mediterranean in the north. The project under Gaddafi's direction would take decades to complete and become the largest and most sophisticated irrigation system ever built. It would permanently change Libya's course as a nation. This massive network of pipes would be constructed beneath the desert sands to prevent evaporation, and pumps would be constructed to irrigate and bring the water up to Libya's surface. The Libyans eventually gave this project the name Great Man-Made River Project. This system was calculated to be able to supply roughly 2.4 cubic kilometers of fresh water annually to its more than 7 million citizens of Libya in the cities of the north, which isn't much water, but was sufficient enough to give Libya an equivalent amount of usable water now, as Luxembourg has in Europe, and more water than Saudi Arabia has. Dependent on importing water from Europe, the Libyans decided to spend billions to develop their own water system, since importing water was too costly, which also made them vulnerable to Europe. Libyans spent decades building their own entire network of underground water pipes. As of now, Libyans have invested more than $25 billion in finishing what they already have, which was the initial concept back then, and technically is still the current plan, to develop the enormous artificial reservoir known as the Nile. Phase 1 of the system's construction only began back in 1984. The Great Man-Made River Authority was founded to fulfill specific water volume requirements within particular geographic areas. The Hamada, Surte, and Kufra basins are the first three of five significant underground water basins in southern Libya. All of these reservoirs are close to southeast Egypt and are connected to the larger Nubian sandstone aquatic forests that spans the entire country. In addition to their portion of their vast reservoirs, the Libyans also had sovereignty over the Murzak Basin in the southwest and the New Sahara Basin in the northwest. The 
first stage of the project focused on constructing the water pipeline that would transport water from the vast Nubian sandstone reservoirs from Asafir and Zirbo in the south all the way up to Benghazi and Cairo in the north. The project's biggest stage required an absurd number of materials. Phase 1 was finished by the Libyans in 1996 after a 12-year period, providing 2 million cubic meters of water per day to the thirsty cities in the north. Phase 1 required roughly about 2.5 million tons of cement, 13 million tons of aggregate, 2 million kilometers of wire, and over a quarter of a million sections of concrete pipes, each measuring an astonishing 8 meters in diameter. Shortly after that, the second phase began. Tripoli, Libya's largest city and capital and its surroundings now receive more than a million cubic meters of water daily thanks to western pipeline construction that began in the Mirzak Basin. They spent four years finishing this phase by the year 2000. The main goal of phase 3 was to increase the amount of water available to Benghazi and Serta by connecting a new pipeline from the Nubian sandstone reservoirs to the already existing phase 1 network. The system still had gaps where it hadn't yet been built by the time this phase was finally completed in 2009. Phase 5 would finally build a lineup in the north that would largely unify the western and eastern systems together and also largely unify the Great Man Made River into a single finished system across the country. But these final phases were destined to never be completed because just two years after the completion of Phase 3, Phase 4 plans for new lines to be constructed from these reservoirs to the north, finally connecting the city of Tobruk to a reservoir. Gaddafi and the political unrest brought on by the Arab Spring destabilized a lot of things concerning the water project, though it was almost 100% complete. More than 10 years ago, when Gaddafi's tyranny was overthrown in Libya, it brought up a number of significant issues pertaining to the 21st century society. Despite the abundance of oil in the area, it was obvious that poverty was primarily to blame for the disorder at the time in the Arab world. In contrast to some of the differences between the United States and some of the world's poorest countries, like Zimbabwe, which has a low standard of living in the world, a third of the population of Libya lives in abject poverty, and the average Libyan earns only 14% of the average American's income. Why does Libya have a lower standard of living? despite its abundant natural resource which is oil. Let us know your answer in the comments. What restrictions exist inside Libya that prevent them from being more successful like the United States? Is Libya's poverty a problem that cannot be fixed or is it inevitable? Let us know in the comments section how you feel and what you think after watching all of this. Before you go to the next video, please give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe and turn on the notification bell so you wouldn't miss out whenever we upload a new video. We'll see you in our next video.